Here we go. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jordan Krasinski, and I serve as the Director of Membership with Good Business Colorado. Uh, good Business Colorado is a statewide, nonpartisan business association of over 240 values-driven business owners who are committed to building a prosperous, equitable, and sustainable Colorado. Our members know that they have a role in shaping public policy that impacts our communities and our businesses. We challenge the lines of partisanship and lead with our values. Before we kick off today's uh, session, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our amazing partners and co-sponsors. Uh, uh, the Bell Policy Center, Best for Colorado, a program of the Alliance Center, the Colorado Black Chamber of Commerce, Center for Community Wealth Building, the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Pueblo, MAPR Agency, uh, Sistabiz Global Network, and Small Business Majority. Thank you all so much for your support. Um, after today's Q&A session, you'll receive an email with a feedback form and more information about each of our co-sponsors. Please take a moment to let us know what you thought of today's virtual event and learn more about our organiz uh, partner organizations. For now, I'll go ahead and kick it off to Karen Moldovan to tell you more about today's expert panel. Hey everyone, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us on your Friday. Um, we're going to jump into our content pretty quickly, but I wanted to first just introduce our panelists so you know who you're talking with and hearing from this morning. Uh, just so folks know, they're going to do a presentation first and we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for folks to put in your questions in a chat box and I'll be moderating that. Uh, so definitely, you know, feel free to use that chat box as we go along and we'll be circling back to your questions. Um, so with us this morning, we have Seth Levine, who's a partner at the Foundry Group, which focuses on making early stage technology investments, participating in select growth rounds, identifying and supporting the next generation of venture fund managers. Foundry has 2.5 billion under management with about 20% of its investments in Colorado companies. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition to Foundry, Seth is also the co-founder of Pledge 1%, a global network of over 7,000 companies who pledged equity, time, and product back to their local communities. Give me just one second, I've got a morning call. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, we also have Lou Vishner. He's the founder and CEO of, CEO of Lou's List, a professional finance and accounting job board of over 11,000 members in Colorado. It helps businesses to find finance and accounting talent by posting over 100 jobs a month, Lou recently retired from a 25-year CFO career, where he was, he was CFO for six different technology-related businesses over that time. He's also been extremely involved in the Colorado community, serving on boards of, uh, serving as the president of various boards of directors. And then finally, we have Lord Noble, who's, who co-founded Simple Startup with his wife. Simple Startup is a Boulder-based finance and accounting firm specializing in serving national tech and retail clients. Simple Startup offers growth-focused bookkeeping, investor-ready accounting, CFO services, and online startup financial education. He's a QuickBooks Pro Advisor with a certificate in advanced financial modeling from the London School of Business and Finance. So we are thrilled to have all three of you and your, your expertise and really just to talk through what you're seeing, what you're learning, and what you're doing through really an unprecedented time for all of us. So I'm going to kick it over to Seth and we'll jump right into the content. Awesome. Karen, thank you so much. Jordan, thank you as well. Um, well, first, let me say I hope this, uh, thank you for joining us. I hope, I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Um, getting used to sort of this is the new normal, seeing a whole bunch of, uh, of grid view of faces on my screen. Um, but I, I wanted to, to sort of preface this uh, webinar by talking just for a moment about the the COVID-19 Finance Assistance uh, Network. Uh, what you're seeing here is the splash page um, that, uh, that you'll find if you go to uh, financeassistancenetwork.com. Uh, um, and really, we, we put the network together because we wanted uh, to help small businesses and to help them for free um, navigate some of the challenges around uh, the current financial crisis. Um, Lou called me it's right about a month ago. It was the 1st of April. Um, and and we, he and I had a conversation. He he just reached out to ask, like, what can we do? Um, and in that conversation, one of the things we talked about was just how confusing, frankly, the landscape is. And not just 
the government programs that are available because there's there are many different flavors of that but but also just what should businesses be doing right now and how should they be preparing um and i had mentioned to lou that uh, at foundry at my firm we've spent i mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours helping our uh the companies in our portfolio try to figure out how to navigate the crisis um and i was concerned that given how complicated this is um that 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 level of assistance wasn't necessarily available to uh, to smaller companies, companies that weren't a part of the network like that. And so we, we came up with the idea of leveraging Lou's list, which is a list of over 10,000 finance professionals, people like Lauren, like Lou, uh, to, uh, to create a network of, of finance pros to offer free advice to companies that were, were trying to figure out how to navigate through the, the crisis. Um, Less than 24 hours later, Lou sent a note out to the to his CFO list. Uh, we immediately had 30. We're now up to about 100 finance pros that have volunteered to help out, and we have more waiting in the wings. We've actually stopped taking on additional uh, people on the finance side because we've got enough at the moment. Um, and then the day after that, we launched we launched the finance assistance network. Um, we have uh, we have over 150 actually as of this morning we had almost 200 companies that are receiving pro bono support through this, um, and uh, and we've got a lot of capacity so we would like to help more businesses. So you know this webinar really is to serve two purposes. One is there's quite a bit of interesting content, um, and I hope that people will walk away with with uh, you know with real key takeaways. And of course it's also a chance at the end to ask questions. Um, but uh, but it's also uh, sort of an advertisement, if you will, for the fan. Um, and if people have more complicated questions or questions that are very specific to your business, the thing to do is to go to the financeassistancenetwork.com website. The, the intake form is pretty simple. It's really mostly contact information and a little bit of contextual information about your business. Um, and uh, and we'll match you then with uh, with a finance professional too to help with your specific situation and, and give advice. Um, we have a few other people involved. High Plains Advisors is sort of the third leg of the Lou, Seth uh, fan assistance network uh, stool, and, and they're helping us uh, kind of coordinate the back end of all of this. And then we do have uh, access also to legal accounting and other business expertise. Um, so it's not just finance that we're able to offer help on, but it, it's a, a broader set of issues. Um, so with that, I'd like to, Turn it over to Lauren, and we can get into the the meat of the content for this webinar. Great, thank you, Seth. Um, so the Financial Assistance Network is a fantastic offering, and I highly encourage those that can help to apply and those that need help to ask. Okay, so this whole webinar is about cash flow and finding ways to extend it during the economic crisis. Now, Karen mentioned this, these are unprecedented times and it calls for like unprecedented measures to make informed decisions, extend your runway and protect your business. So the question then is, how do you extend your runway? Well, much like measuring your stomach at the start of an exercise weight loss program, you need to take stock of the status quo. In other words, you need to know how much cash you have in your business right now then you need to understand if you are maintaining cash, accumulating cash, or burning cash. Now, I'm guessing that the majority, if not all of you on this call, on this webinar, are here because you're in the latter position. In other words, you're at least burning cash or forecasting to be burning cash. So assuming so, let's, let's first take stock. In order to determine your runway, the first thing to know is your cash balance. If you don't know this already, simply log into all of your online banking systems, for your business that is, not your personal accounts, and total all of the bank balances. Having an understanding of your cash balance is one thing, but it's not gonna tell us how long your business can survive with this amount of cash. In order to do this, we need to understand how much cash you are burning. And there are two ways to look at your cash burn. One is on a gross burn basis, and the other is on a net burn basis. Let me quickly explain the difference between the two. Gross burn looks at all of your cash outflows and doesn't include any inflows, usually over an average month. It is totally intentional to not include your inflows in gross burn as the purpose here is to understand how much cash outflow there is assuming no sales in your business. You may call this a doomsday scenario planning. 
Net burn, on the other hand, is simply looking at your true cash flow, both cash coming into your business and cash leaving your business. And as with gross burn, net burn is usually calculated over an average month. Now, please note for both gross burn and net burn, some months of cash inflows and outflows may be higher and some months may be lower. So I'd advise taking an average of the last three months in order to paint a more accurate picture of reality. So calculating your runway is relatively simple. You take the current cash position and divide this by your gross or net burn. Divide it by the gross burn to help you paint that doomsday scenario and help you gain some clarity and hence focus, i.e. this is what happens if zero money comes in the door. Divide this by the net burn to help provide you a more accurate position as you will inevitably still be making some sales. Okay, so nothing beats an example. Let's give you one. So we have a food company, let's call it Nuts About Us, and it has $50,000 in the bank as of today. Their cash outflows and hence gross burn are $25,000 per month, and therefore on a gross basis, they have two months of runway. Their cash inflows have been $15,000 per month, leaving a cash shortfall of $10,000 per month. The difference between that $15,000 of, of income and $25,000 of expenses. This is the company's net burn. On a net burn basis, in other words, a more accurate picture of reality, the company has five months of runway. $50,000, divided by $10,000, which is your net burn. Now, you may have noticed that we have, what we've done here, we've looked at historical information to project your runway. And you'll be correct to assume that this is somewhat flawed. And what do I mean by this? Well, what happens if the past is now no longer a good indicator of the future? So well done for thinking about this and hang tight because we'll be specifically addressing our recommendations on how to extend your runway later in this webinar by looking at forecasted cash inflows and forecasted cash outflows. So I'm gonna actually head over into Lou in the next slide, and he's gonna be talking through a little bit more about the resources to help your business survive and extend your runway. Over to you, Lou. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Um, you know, as Seth mentioned, we started this thing based on a 30 minute catch up call exactly one month ago today. And a lot's happened in a month, both I think in our country and with the Finance Assistance Network. Um, you know, we do believe we're helping companies in our communities um, survive. And we're sharing this with you today so that if you and or your company need help, or you know someone that might, you realize what resources are available to you. So before I jump in, I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Good Business Colorado and all the sponsors here for putting this on and helping us get the word out. But I also wanted to thank uh, Lauren Noble for his generous donation of his time and his company towards this effort. And then a big thanks to Seth for his vision, his leadership, and his swiftness in helping us form this finance assistance network. You know, we're kind of getting known as the fan, as, as Seth mentioned. We, we did a, another webinar uh, about a week or so ago and somebody actually reached out to the radio station the fan to see if we could get some time on the on the radio station because i think they're having a little trouble with content given though there's a lack of sports these days so we might get on there who knows but hey let's uh, let's just re review briefly a few resources uh, available to many companies to help them potentially survive and extend their runway um so most of you I'm sure have heard a lot or at least some about the CARES Act, given all the data being put out by experts and consultants and trade organizations and the like. Um, you know, we're not gonna spend a lot of time here because um, I think, but I do think it's important to highlight a couple of the programs just because they can potentially have the largest and beneficial, most beneficial impact to your business. And those two are the Paycheck Protection Program and the Emergency Injury Disaster Relief Loan Packages. Um, so why is this 2.5 now and growing, might even be $2.6 trillion um, CARES Act so massive? 
and the largest stimulus package the government's ever done. While the government and the leaders in our country at least have learned, I believe, that from 2007 to 2009 financial crisis, that the number one issue with the recovery was the almost 10 years it took to get unemployment back to acceptable levels. And so this CARES Act is focused almost solely on keeping and getting employees working. Um, we'll review two of these programs, as I mentioned, quickly and see if they can help you. Um, but before we do that, there's a few other resources. Um, just recently, the state of Colorado announced a Colorado State Work Share Program where you can apply and be awarded financial uh, relief for reduced employee hours uh, where you've um, kept people on, but you just reduced their hours in order to you know, maybe shared some roles. And so there's a program. We're just learning a little bit about that one, and we should be up to speed soon on that. Um, there are other loans and programs that are out there. There's the Main Street Loan Program, which is for larger companies. Um, some could be relevant to you, but we're just not gonna highlight those today. Unemployment's another category that you can use as a resource, obviously, and we'll discuss that briefly. But, um, you know, the, the interesting, there's a lot of timing aspects of when you have employees on unemployment versus when you use your Paycheck Protection Program loan. And we can talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, the government also provided an additional $600 a week that may help some of your employees um, in an interim time while you get funded here, um, if you can apply for those loans. Um, and for the first time ever, I believe, unemployment has been made available to 1099 independent contractors, um, and historically it has not been. So the FAN is also here to help, and we'll talk about some specifics on the resources we have available and how we might help. Um, and then finally, we'll have some ideas for you, as uh, Lauren mentioned, around cash flow and extending your runway. So let's go to the next slide and touch briefly on what's known as um, PPP or Triple P um, and highlighting some of the criteria so that you can assess if this is something that might fit for you or you might need help from the fan on it. Again, I'm just spending a little bit of time here because, again, it could be the biggest and most beneficial uh, cash inflow to you. And uh, it could be free money as we'll talk about. So, you know, the first tranche from the uh, government was 300, almost $350 billion. They sold out, went through that relatively fast. The country waited for a little bit for them to uh, replenish the, the amount. And they came out with a second tranche of about 310 billion. Uh, I don't know how fast they're getting through that. I think it's relatively fast. and some estimates are that it, it could be used up as early as next week. Um, you can get up to $10 million. You must have fewer than 500 employees to be eligible. Um, it's generally, and it, it can be a little complicated, but it's generally one month of your gross payroll times 2.5. You have to adjust for anyone that makes $100,000 or more. And that's the max you can include for any individuals, 100,000. There's a, a lot of people that have gotten the loan already, um, and now there's a huge, huge push um, and angst and confusion, uh, complexity around how you spend that money in the next eight weeks, because if you spend it in accordance with the guidelines, the amount you spend in those eight weeks will be likely forgiven, meaning you don't have to pay that back. It's going to be free money to you if you follow the guidelines. And again, there's new guidelines we are expecting to come out from the SBA. There's a lot of confusion around the ones that are out there. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some questions probably at the end on that. Um, it, at the end of the eight weeks, um, you will have a balance left that will be not forgiven. And that will be a loan over two years at 1%. You don't have to start paying that for six months. Uh, and it'll be over a, a 18 month amortization. Um, again, only at 1%. The um, program ends June 30, a little confusion there as to what that means, but uh, whether they're, if you haven't got your loan by then, can you still get it? You can hire folks back. And one of the interesting things here is that employers do not count their 1099 or independent contractors, that you must, um, the independent contractors and 1099 folks have to apply for a PPP loan on their own if they're eligible. 
So let's move to the next slide, which is another CARES Act program, acronymed EIDL, um, Emergency Injury Disaster Loan. It's similar to the PPP in some ways, but this one is a true loan. There's no forgiveness or free money portion generally. Um, and, uh, but if you need a loan to extend your runway and assuming funds remain available here, this could be a very easy and pretty cheap or inexpensive financing available to you depending on your, your circumstances. So um, just quickly, we'll highlight these things. You can get up to $2 million in loans. The interest rate's 3.75%. This one you file directly with the SBA. You do not have to go through your bank, uh, which is unlike the PPP loan where you have to go through a financial institution. Um, you can apply for both uh, IDLE and PPP. You just have to use the funds for different reasons uh, and purposes. Uh, the two to three week turnaround time, I think it's longer than that. Um, it's probably closer to four, no collateral for up to $25,000 and no personal guarantees up to 200,000. And it can be approved on your, co your corporate credit score. Um, it's up to a 30 year term and no payments for the first year. So again, a good, good way to uh, extend your runway if financing is, is available to you. So now before Lauren gets into some details and ideas for you to think about and, and explore ways to decrease your burn rate and extend your runway. Uh, I wanted to share with you a bit, a little bit more about the Finance Assistance Network, the resources we have available in and around the FAN, and how we're helping companies. So let's go to the next slide. And then at the um, end of the presentation, and on the, I think on the Good Business website, there will be links to the FAN webpage. You can log in. Um, you can get to that web page and on there is a two opportunities for two things. One for you to uh, fill out a quick form if you uh, need some help and within um, 24 to 48 hours we'll match you up with a volunteer uh, to bring the, whatever resources uh, looks like are necessary to try to help you survive. Um, the, the slide got a little outdated but we currently as Seth mentioned we have over we have almost a hundred senior finance professionals already. Um, as he also mentioned, we, we do a little bit more than just finance. If you need it, we have ex, HR experts available. We have some coaching, both individual and team coaches available. Um, we can, we have, our finance folks will do immediate kind of cash flow triage and Lauren will talk a lot about that. Um, we are spending a lot of time on the PPP and IDLE loans. We can do forecasting and modeling, you know, cash flow scenarios. Um, we have some tax, advisors that can help. There are certain tax strategies, um, some things that come through the CARES Act that have allowed you to do some things from tax perspective. Um, we have a, a, a list of financing sources. Uh, some are banks, some are not banks, uh, but mostly, you know, again, we're, we're here to help you try to reduce expenses, maybe defer expenses, um, increase revenue, and, and the like. The big thing here is um, it's all free of charge or pro bono. Um, and I think that's very helpful to some of these companies that are trying to survive. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Lauren and he's again gonna go through some more cash flow stuff for you. So thanks for listening. Need to take myself off mute. All right, thank you, Lou. Um, and as a member of the FAN, one of the pro bono resources that Simple Startup has created is a special COVID-19 focused cash management course. Um, there's never been a more critical time for companies to understand and be more efficient uh, with their cash flow management. So we redesigned our popular cash manager program and have made it available to every business right now for free as part of the FAN's offering. The first thing any business needs to do is to immediately understand its cash flow position. And with that information, business owners and nonprofit leaders can begin working out how to make the most of PPP funds, loan and tax credits to keep your business up and running through COVID. So this is exactly why we are making our cash manager course available for free today to help companies understand their position and give access to the tools you can use moving forward. So with an easy to follow video format, as well as a downloadable cash manager that will be, enable every company to quickly find its current cash position and then test out different ways to make 
the most of the scarce dollars? For example, how will you extend your runway if you ask your team to go half salaries? Or how will you best use PPP funds or set up a revised payment plan with your vendors? This is where the cash manager can help because it's a at a touch of a button. You'll know exactly how long your runway is. And again, no matter their, your financial knowledge, each company will have an incredible foundation to meet or to, to make the most pro bono services that FAN is offering. So you can go to your FAN advisor with a clear information about where you are right now using this tool and how long your runway is, making your work with that FAN advisor even more productive and efficient. Your FAN advisor can then focus on helping you with the higher level financial strategy to extend that runway. Think of it like a building block that will help make your skyscraper taller and also more stable. You can get access to this course by using the link on the final resources slide that we'll share with you later. Okay, so jumping onto the next slide, extending our runway. So the first thing, okay, so we talked a lot about taking stock of your current cash position and a little bit about how you can use the pro bono cash manager to project your runway based on what you think is going to happen with cash in and out over the next 90 days. So what we're going to talk about now is our tips and tricks to ensure you are able to extend your runway as far as possible. First up is to keep your customers. Okay, so you got me. This is a very straightforward suggestion, but it's often within the simple things that we find most value. Now is the time to truly care for your customers. Deliver everything that you can to them. Go above and beyond. Remember why you started your business in the first place. And if necessary, use this as an opportunity to reinvent yourself, your business model, and perhaps your pricing structure. It's also possible that you can now prioritize certain customer initiatives and gain team buy-in on them. So what are you likely experiencing with your customers? My guess is that at worst, you're losing customers as they cut costs. And at best, you're being put under significant pressure to reduce the cost of your products or services to them. You're therefore likely to be finding yourself in a negotiation and one that you're probably not appreciating. Now, the first thing I'd like to add to everyone is to say that the first thing to remember is that negotiations can actually be fun. So take a second to sit back and relax and the negotiation is going to happen regardless of your state of mind. So start by taking a deep breath. My advice is to create win-wins with your customers, but also ensure you maintain and hence protect your margins. Don't simply accept demands for discounts, bend over and be done with it. At Simple Startup, we have a number of core values, one of which is to treat our customers and ourselves like rock stars, because we are. Don't forget that a great negotiation ends with a win-win. If you're on the receiving end of customers trying to reduce their costs, then here are three examples of how you could create win-wins and hence continue treating your customers and yourselves like rock stars. Number one, you could provide a discount to help with their cash flow needs and in return, sign your customer up to a longer term contract. Number two, you could provide a discount and in return, offer that discount as a 0% loan, for instance, where they're obligated to return the loan balance to you at a predefined later date. You could provide a discount, number three, to save them cash and in return deliver less services or a lower quality product that still meets their needs. Obviously, be clear and upfront about this and have a written agreement. What I'm trying to labor here is that finding mutual ground is both in your and your customer's interests and to have a happy customer as the outcome. Remember, if you respect yourself and go into this as an enjoyable activity, you will undoubtedly end up with a better result. Now, the final point here, the silver lining, so to speak, is that this is a great opportunity to further learn who your ideal customers are. You can then become even more focused with your company's marketing. Okay, so the next slide, we're gonna be talking about increasing cash in. And accounts receivable is the first area here that we're gonna talk about. So depending on your business model, you will likely have accounts receivable balances as of today, which is the amount of money that your customers owe you. And hopefully not too many of these are aging. In other words, they're past their due date. Regardless, you need to be collecting on these customers' invoices. 
Now, I highly advise assigning a risk rating to the customer. Which of your invoices and hence customers will cause greatest risk to your business? A simple low, medium or high will suffice. Now, this helps you prioritize your list. Once you've done this, I would assign a specific person to your team to be liaising with these customers. This could either be you as your business owner or your accounting department, or perhaps even an account executive that made the sale in the first place. Maybe they can find an angle that you or your accountant team are not seeing. In addition, you could decide to reduce the terms that you offer your customers and hence collect on cash faster or even start doing credit checks on new companies and decide whether or not you want to offer them any terms at all. You may even decide to only take advanced payments from customers going forward. Everything and anything is possible. So alternatively, you could make a decision to factor these invoices. Now, what do I mean by factoring? Factoring is the process of selling your invoices to a third party. You can do some very quick Googling and you'll be able to find a multitude of different factoring companies. Finally, and always as a last resort, but if you feel like your customer is not open to talking and you are therefore finding it challenging to come to any form of mutual agreement, a collection agency could be your last and necessary resort. So the next area here is financing opportunities. Clearly leverage on the existing financing opportunity relationships that you have. Have you fully drawn down on your line of credit, for instance? Perhaps you can extend this line of credit further with your bank. Have you already applied for your PPP loan? And have you been successful in, in having the funding allocated and received? Have you considered using your assets as collateral to secure additional financing and hence receive cash through that, that manner? This could, um, this piece, piece of financing could, uh, sorry, excuse me, this could be a financing a piece of equipment, for instance, that you own outright, or perhaps a form of inventory financing if you hold inventory. Again, anything is possible, so look at your balance sheet here. The next area, and likely a last resort, that you can sell your assets to release cash. You could either sell off inventory at a great price to release short-term cash, um, but be careful that this doesn't cripple your inventory reserves and hence squash your margins. The last port of call here is, this could be to sell a piece of equipment and change your business model to be more outsourced. While this will likely have an impact on your margins, you will be releasing some capital which could be needed at the moment. Finally, some other creative ideas. The list of other creative ideas is only as limited as your imagination. So here are a couple of others. You could team up with other organizations that you are friendly with and create a buying operative to try and help drive down price and as a result have greater um, bulk buying potential. You could lease everything and don't buy anything. That involves computers, software, fixtures, fittings, furniture, all of these sorts of things. And you can turn, turn all of your annual payments into monthly, those that you may be paying in advance, for instance. Now, it may cost you slightly more in the long run, but it will reduce your, your short-term need for big lumps of cash out. So let's move on to the next um, slide and talking about decreasing cash out. So the first and uh, most significant cash out in any business is staffing. So there are many ways that you can look at your staff. Uh, obvious initiatives to consider are potential pay cuts. Typically, the more senior the staff, the greater the cut. There could be reduced hours. You can put some of your staff from salaried to wage-based, giving a little bit more payroll flexibility. You could furlough your staff, which is basically a temporary layoff from work and gives staff the opportunity to claim unemployment. In general, people are not paid during furloughs, but they can keep and they can keep their employment benefits, such as health insurance. Now, furloughs are not mandatory, um, but workers are ordered not to do any, anything work related while they're on a furlough. And finally, the PPP loan forgiveness on payroll. Now, Lou's talked about this, and I fully agree that you should continue to apply and get in the queue regardless of what you hear about the current SBA allocation, you know, uh, where they are at their current page. Get that PPP in, highly, highly advise and recommend that, and work with some of the fan networks that are going to help you there. So the one thing to think really carefully about when you take action on staffing, don't forget how long it has taken you to grow these employees in your firm. 
Therefore, when making changes to your staff, be careful to trim the flesh, so to speak, but I personally avoid cutting into the bone of your organization because you run the risk of literally handicapping yourself when we all start recovering. So the second is to carefully manage your outstanding accounts payable and negotiate with your vendors. So write down a list of what you owe other people and when, rank them in order of importance, again with the biggest bills and most important relationships first, and get on the phone to those people. Can you extend your runway um, by sort of agreeing to a payment plan with them? Can they change your terms so that you have longer to pay? Now, don't be a chump and just not pay bills. If for no other reason, then you may end up burning bridges with people that you need in the future. People will remember how you behave during this crisis, and if it wasn't pretty, that will potentially damage relationships long term. Again, like your customers, concentrate on finding win-wins. So the third is to capitalize on your credit cards. You'll likely have a credit card and likely have access to credit with your credit card provider. What I want to be really clear on is that credit card interest rates are incredibly high. So be really careful with this option. What you therefore ought to do, especially if you already have a large balance sitting on your credit card and you are being charged interest for it, is to apply for a credit card with 0% financing until next year. Now, there are many of these available. A quick 30 seconds of Googling and you'll find a list of the best 0% credit cards. Now, make sure that, um, that, that, that these have a 0% balance transfer so that you can move over existing credit card balances. Many of these credit card providers will give you a 0% lifeline for 12 to 18 months, depending on that provider. So great, cheap capital there. The fourth is to negotiate your rent. Now, this comes back to the old saying as if you don't ask, you don't get. Nothing is off the table in this current environment. Your landlord would appreciate a telephone call and your success is also in their interest too. Voids are very costly to landlords and they would like to keep your custom. So offering a pay, so offering to pay like a reduced rent, but committing perhaps to a longer contract is another example of a win-win for both of you. The fifth here is to renegotiate with your insurance providers. Now, the obvious way to save cash is to cancel all of these insurance policies. However, a word of caution, now may be the most important time to have coverage, especially for directors and officers of your company, as any, every man and his dog will be looking for cash themselves. Insurance could therefore be your best friend this year. So fear not, there are three specific ways that you can decrease cash out without canceling your insurance policies. Number one, you could reduce your coverage. Now it doesn't make sense um, to pay for something that you're not receiving, right? So there is an opportunity right now to lower your premiums rather than waiting for your policy to expire and doing this before your policy expires. So many companies are expe expecting a significant decrease to their revenues or, uh, or their staff this year, and therefore you don't need the same coverage. So again, don't wait till your policy expires to provide updated information to your carriers. There, there's hundreds, if not potentially thousands of dollars sitting on the table here. You could also go into payment plans. You could talk to your broker or insurance carrier about setting up a payment plan instead of paying quarterly or annually up front to negotiate the charges for doing so. So perhaps you can defer your insurance payment for a month or two. I've seen examples of insurance carriers helping in both of these cases. The third one here is premium financing. Now, this may not apply to everyone and every policy, but some brokers have done, they've kind of financed your insurance policies in order for them to receive payment up front and the insurance company to be paid over the year. So policyholders are often unaware of this. Always read the small print and the broker is possibly making some additional margin here in your deal. Now this may equate to 11, 12, 13% of your policy premium that could in theory be in your back pocket. So pay attention to that one and, and negotiate that one. The six is payroll expenses here, payroll taxes rather. So under the CARES Act, there is the ability to defer the employer portion of your payroll taxes during the deferred period, the 27th of March to the end of this, sorry, 27th of March to the end of this year, 31st of December. So these amounts to about sort of 6.2% employer portion of the social security tax that can be paid in two installments, again, helping with cash flow here. 
So half of that deferred amount must be paid by the end of December, 31st of December 2021, and the remaining half uh, must be paid by the 31st of December 2022. It's still available to all employees, regardless of impacts your business through the coronavirus. So please note, there will always be small print and exceptions, one of which is that you cannot claim forgiveness on your PPP loan in the eight weeks following the loan payment, and also defer the payroll component of payroll tax in that period too. So I recommend talking to your accountant or payroll provider or one of the FAN network for more information on this. The seventh and final is discretionary expenses. The obvious place here is to avoid all discretionary spending. My advice is to pull the last three months of your bank and credit card statements, do a review of all of your recurring expenses, look at your subscriptions, CRMs, email providers. Is there anything here that you don't need? If so, cancel it. So before we jump onto the next slide, I, I know that, um, well, Actually, no, we can, we can move straight on to the next slide. I think that's good. So how do you know when you have hit the right balance here? So can a great question. It somewhat depends on the stage of your company, the industry that you're in, and whether you are VC-backed growth company or not. Um, as an absolute minimum, I want to make sure that you all have cash, right? So you all have cash to take you to the end of the year at least. If you are a growth-backed VC company, I want to make sure that you have even more cash, enough ca cash to kind of last you 18 months uh, of runway and ideally 80, uh, 24 months of runway. So keep playing with all of these ideas. Get creative and ensure that you have cash to not only survive the crisis, but also thrive when, not if, we come out the other side. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Lou, Seth, and I would now to love to take any kind of answers and questions that you may have. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just really appreciate this conversation and just the different tools, ideas, strategies that you're giving folks and that there's sort of an ongoing network that people can tap into. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of our questions are around the triple P and the idol, which I think uh, just makes sense right now. Uh, so I'll probably just start diving into those and let and tell folks, you know, use the chat box. Um, I think we can get through a lot in the next 15 minutes. Uh, first one, first couple about the triple P. When the triple P loans are forgiven, will the company have to claim the amount forgiven as income on their tax returns? Uh, do you want to take that one? I was coming off mute. I, I can answer that. Uh, no, you won't. It will not be taxable to you. That's a great simple answer. Yep. Um, so another one. So new company launched in February, only employee and pre-revenue. Uh, any chance at all to qualify for any of these federal loans? When did they launch? February? February. Don't have the exact date. Um, I think you might be able to. There was a criteria that if you were a new business, you could look at your payroll in January and February of 2020 and use that as a basis for what you could apply for. So mm -hmm. I believe that it is possible to do that, being a new business. Great, thank you. Um, so another Triple P question. This eight week window has folks a little bit concerned just looking at uh, sort of the public health and public safety issues that we very well could still be dealing with eight weeks from now. Um, so questions on, you know, how can you reemploy people, get folks back on the payroll if the business is still closed or you're only able to operate, you know, in an extremely limited capacity. So are you all aware of conversations at the federal level around exemptions being created for that forgiveness criteria? You know, I had a conversation with, um, our congressman last night actually about this very specific question. Uh, Lou mentioned this. I mean, the reality is the Triple P is essentially a federalized uninsured, uh, unemployment program. Um, they're, they're paying companies to pay workers through this eight-week period. And I think it was designed at a time when uh, there was a view that that eight-week period would be enough time to kind of see us through this. Obviously, that that's changed a little bit. Um, so there, there are there is some discussion about modifying the criteria to potentially allow you to, right now under the PPP, you have to spend 
of the uh, of the the money to uh, on payroll in order to qualify for forgiveness. There is some discussion about uh, providing additional flexibility, either lowering that threshold, and or um, that the money is also limited to very specific things. You can use it for payroll, rent, utility, essentially. Um, and there's some discussion about uh, expanding the, the things that you can use it for. So uh, there is another aid package that's in the in the process of being worked on. I think it'll it'll be under discussion over the next couple of weeks. And this is one of the areas that they're thinking about modifying. That's specific to the types of businesses that just there's really no way for them to bring workers back. And I think there's also a recognition that at least through July 1, when the unemployment, uh, additional unemployment benefit ends, um, that for many individual workers, it's actually better for them at this point to be on unemployment rather than being called back in to either jobs that don't really exist uh, or jobs that aren't, aren't feasible to do during this shelter in, in, in place period. Yeah, I think that's an area that we're just going to need to see some, some ongoing guidance on um, and really stay connected about that technical assistance and, and really what's happening nationally and what is safe and what's feasible. Um, another triple P question around sort of, we know that there's that 75% that has to be used for payroll. Um, so this is a scenario of a company that employs part-time sort of teenage workers, has one manager that works, you know, less, um, less than 40 hours a week. Um, can that triple P loan be used to pay the business owner a paycheck or does he have to use it for these part-time employees as well? Does that make sense? So stipulations over who who um, needs to receive those payroll benefits within the company? Yeah, it's generally guided by how you applied for that. If the business, it depends on how the business owner is compensated generally. Um, there's different ways that that gets done. If uh, the business owner is set up as an S corporation and pays himself through payroll, then he was able to apply for whatever his payroll was along with his other employees. If he was um, an LLC and records information on schedule C through on line 31 of his tax return, he can uh, include that amount as long as it does not in exceed over a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Um, so it kind of depends on how that business owner was paid and what the employees, how, how they assembled the employees to, to get the amount that they actually got. So very similar on um, how you applied for the loan is how you should actually pay the people going forward. Um, obviously you may, you can't pay them more um, in, in most cases. And um, there are some comparative period uh, FTE com uh, uh, criteria in the loan package, which I think is uh, comparing um, like a March to June period last year to this year. Um, so it, I know that one, this probably gets a little more complicated, but for the most part, it depends on how that owner uh, applied for the loan or that business owner. Got it. That makes sense. Karen, I'd just say this is a good example of of you know use the fan, right? That the the answer isn't super straightforward, and and this is kind of why we set it up. That's great to know. There's an ongoing resource outside of you know an hour long webinar. Uh, just a follow up question though. Um, spoke with a business owner that was able to access the triple P. A lot of her employees are college students who, unfortunately, you know, college classes aren't in session, not sure when they're starting back up, so they've gone home. Um, she thinks she can hire a couple new employees. Are there any stipulations under the PPP around um, needing that payroll dollars to go to previous employees, or can she use that to put new employees on the payroll? Uh, I believe, well, the, the current guidance is silent on that. Um, but we believe it's fine to hire replacements. Um, We've been interpreting it the same way. Yeah. So. Thank you. So a couple questions on the idle. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with business owners lately, and I feel like this is the number one question we're getting. Uh, folks aren't, they're not aware of their status. They applied for the idol, you know, a month ago, over a month ago, no notifications at all on the status. What would you, is, is there any, um, recommendations or feedback we can sort of filter up around uh, how to figure out what's going on with the idol. Yeah, I only know of two ways. 
to, to figure that out. And you have to go direct to the SBA. Um, it's my understanding. I mean, you can go through the SBA portal. There is an idle portal that you can go through and you have to use your username and password that you used when you applied for the idle loan. And then um, I have a phone number. If anybody wants to, it's 1-800-659-2955. So 1-800-659-2955. Those are the only two ways I know. And you got to get the SBA to answer that. Yeah. We, we have heard, I mentioned this on our last webinar, we have heard anecdotally at least that uh, the Spanish language uh, version of the SBA hotline uh, has shorter wait times. So for those people that uh, are Spanish speakers or have access to someone who is a Spanish speaker, that, that might be a, uh, a faster way to access the SBA because it is, as Lou said, you really just need to contact the SBA. Yeah. And to, and to add to that, uh, Lou, I think there is also a, a, an email address that was provided by the SBA, um, and it's called answerdesk at sba.gov. Answerdesk at sba.gov. I have no idea of the turnaround time on those emails, um, but that is another, another way in which you can try and contact. Awesome. Thank you. We know it's, it's frustrating for folks and long wait times and not getting email responses, um, but I think, honestly, our best guidance right now is just to to keep trying. Um, another related question. So we know that the idol was sent up so that uh, applicants could receive an advance or a grant. So not, not the full amount, but a partial amount. Um, so there was a participant who said that she received a deposit in her account. She's assuming that it's the idol advance. So does this mean, can she imply that the full, um, the full application was approved or just the advance? Can we make that sort of assumption at this point if you if you have gotten some funding? I don't know the answer to whether the full application is approved. I um, Obviously, if you got the funding, that part of it you, you get. It was originally intended to be, or thoughts were it was $10,000 was come automatically. Uh, and then I think subsequently they found out that was about $1,000 per employee. Um, Type thing. So if they got ten thousand dollars and have more than ten employees, they can they can probably keep that and then go check on the status of the other uh, parts of the application. Got it. So a couple questions about payroll. Um, so the payroll tax uh, deferral that that we talked about earlier is that automatic or elected? Uh, so that's kind of part A of the question. And then have you heard of payroll service providers like ADP or Paycheck or some of those other folks, should they be right now able to work with clients to utilize sort of the cash, a cash conservation opportunity that can come from the tax uh, remittance deferral? Uh, I believe it's elective. You have to actually go and say, I'm not gonna pay the employer portion. And yes, you'll have to work with your payroll provider in order to uh, have them do that through their system. I haven't specifically uh, worked or directly with any of the payroll companies to do that, but I'm guessing some folks in our fan network have. Um, but they're obviously they're the ones that pay it uh, on your behalf. And so if you go to them and say, I don't want to pay my employer share of taxes for the rest of 2020, then I believe they'll have something in place to allow you to do that. We've had a few companies do that. And you, you do have to elect it. I, and I would agree in add, adding further to that one, I agree with the election. And the other piece is there are some payroll companies that take those tax payments from you immediately when you run payroll. And there are other payroll companies that don't take that tax payment to you until they pay the authorities. So especially those payroll providers where they do take your tax payments straight away, you want to be speaking with those and make sure that you've got in place that deferral. All right, great. So related question here. Um, around ideas on how to lower the cost of doing payroll. So are there any sort of web-based payroll tools that you would recommend or that the fan could recommend that are streamlined, quick and easy? Um, and would you recommend sort of changing how you operate and manage payroll as a mechanism to save costs? I mean, short answer, there's a ton of payroll providing companies out there. Um, you know, they, some are obviously more expensive than others. Um, you know, within our fan network, we have all kinds that, that 
folks are working with, we could probably share some ideas. Um, we have some local resources in Colorado that have some as well. Um, I, I don't have, I, I wouldn't say a, a low cost provider at the tip of my tongue. Um, I don't know if Lauren or, or Seth do, but. Um, I think it's gonna depend. It's another one that sort of depends a little bit on the nuance of the circumstance. There are, some of the lower cost providers don't have the same flexibility as as some of the higher cost providers so it's going to depend on you know how complicated your payroll is whether you've got uh you know how how the mix of full-time versus part-time uh, there's also some challenges of shifting payroll providers mid-year that you should consider um so I, I, it's a little bit more complicated a question than just that but if you're with someone who's a high cost provider or you're using a, a peo or something else that is also pretty high high cost, you know, it may make sense to look at moving over, but you, you do need to make sure that, uh, that there's not going to be incremental costs of the transition itself. And we can help you work with that. Great. Thanks. So question, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more and then we'll start wrapping up um, and certainly letting folks know, you know, we've got these resources pulled up. Um, it's really fantastic to be able to refer you all for ongoing questions. So we probably haven't gotten to everything, um, but if folks have a last question they want to try to get in, we'll see what we can do. Um, but for, for someone that's a sole proprietor and essentially has no employees, um, is the triple P or the idle even an option with no employees? It, it depends on how you pay yourself, but, but the short answer is yes. Um, but if you're paying yourself on, you know, if you've set up an S corp, you're paying yourself on a schedule K one and you're paying a limited salary. We have seen this with a number of businesses where there are sole proprietorships, but, um, where they, the actual salary is low. It's the calculation of what you can, of the funds you can access might be more limited. Um, but the, but the quick answer is that yes, you can apply as a, a sole proprietor. And in fact, um, 1099 employees are excluded from the payroll calculation for companies and they're they're supposed to be applying on their own so the law actually set up was set up to anticipate this uh, but we do find that there are some people that are getting getting um, kind of stuck in the in the trap of having correctly for tax purposes set themselves up to have a low rel relatively low salary and then pay themselves distributions at the end of the year depending on the type of business um, that has some tax ramifications if you try to reverse it which are, are generally negative so um, I would urge a little bit of caution or at least some analysis on that. Thanks. Um, so I think last question, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but I think folks just are looking for a little bit of reassurance around uh, making sure their idol didn't just disappear into the ether forever. Um, are you all hearing of companies who are getting the idol or are you hearing that a lot of folks are still in the queue? Again, I think folks are just kind of looking for some reassurance that maybe they're not the only one who hasn't heard. Um, so would you say that in your experience, most folks are getting idols or most folks are still waiting? Is that a fair question? <laughs> I, I can quickly jump in to say I've, I've experienced both. Um, I've experienced companies that have received it, um, clients of ours who've received it, friends who've received it. Um, but I've also experienced the other side, which is I'm waiting, sitting, sitting here waiting, and I've got no idea whether I'm going to receive it and where I am in the queue. So I've, I've, I've heard both, unfortunately. Yeah, I'd echo that. Yeah, that's kind of same here at Good Business Colorado. It's a mixed bag. You're not, if you're still waiting, you are not the only person waiting. We can definitely tell you that. Um, so I think we're about out of time, but just want to double check on a question that just came in. Um, folks that are looking for best practices on keeping track of triple P and idle funds, sort of, um, I've heard that a new bank account isn't required. Is that correct? That's correct. Generally, it could be up to the bank though. Um, the bank may require that, but generally you do not need a new, new account. Okay. But best um, practice to be clear is to set up, uh, especially if you're going to seek loan forgiveness, is to set up a separate account, uh, loan forgiveness under the PPP. Uh, to set up a separate account um, and and have your payroll drawn from that account, so you're you're tracking dollar for dollar, the PPP money is actually coming out to payroll. And so it's belled in suspenders because it's not required, but uh, I, the vast majority of companies in our world are doing exactly that. Yeah, right. I would echo that too. I'd say keep track of everything. <laughs> under that forgiveness thing. I mean, make sure you get all that document and I do echo Seth's um, uh, suggestion to have payroll come out of there. You know, we're in weird times. And so I'm guessing some folks are gonna get 
uh, potentially a little weird about what gets in there. I, my, my advice has been, if it's not normally something you would do, um, maybe you should be nervous about doing it. Um, and so if people are kind of trying to figure out how to maximize that forgiveness, um, just be a little cautious, I think, about doing something that you normally would not do. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And um, just again, I, it seems like the Financial Assistance Network would be a great resource for ongoing questions about those best practices for keeping track of the Triple P, the idle funds, uh, bookkeeping. So we hope folks uh, continue to use your team as a resource. But I think we're out of time. Um, this was a great conversation, a lot of really helpful information. So I'm just going to kick it over to, to Deborah, our Executive Director at Good Business Colorado, to, uh, to wrap us up. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, thank you, Jordan and Karen, for putting so much work into organizing this event. Thank you so much for the Financial Assistance Network. Seth, Lou, Lauren, you are amazing, incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. I uh, would love to thank our other event sponsors as well, the Bell Policy Center, Best for Colorado, the Colorado Black Chamber of Commerce, the Center for Community Wealth Building, the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Pueblo, the Sistabiz Global Network, and Small Business Majority. We hope that you will continue to join us for our programming, all aimed at helping Good Business Colorado members and all values-driven businesses across Colorado weather this storm. Our next event is on Monday. We have a town hall with Colorado State Representatives Colin Larson, a Republican, and Alex Valdez, a Democrat, at 1 o'clock p.m. on Monday. Uh, they're both small business owners and we'll be talking about their efforts at the legislature to help small businesses recover from COVID. Um, as Jordan mentioned, you'll be receiving an evaluation. It's really, really helpful for us to understand how we can best support you. If you could just take a couple minutes to provide feedback both on this session as well as uh, ideas for future programming, especially as we start to pivot from recovery to reimagining what the Colorado economy that we want to look like. Um, all that idea for content is really greatly appreciated. So again, thank you so much for everybody for joining us. We look forward to hopefully seeing you on Monday. Bye everybody. Bye -bye.